Welcome to this Education and Philosophy podcast, part of a series introducing key ideas in education and philosophy. The ideas covered in this series are discussed in relation to their potential use to present-day thought and practice. This series draws from the book Education and Philosophy, published by Sage, to which there is a link below. In this podcast, I will introduce some key features of instrumental rationality. As I do so, I will explain how it fits within the overall framework, the framework of modernity, that accompanying podcasts have introduced and discussed. In these accompanying podcasts, I explore how, as a result of the transition from Renaissance to liberal humanism, there was a decisive shift. This occurred as the figure of man, a gendered, ideologically charged concept, is given unprecedented prominence, becoming a substitute, in many cases, for the figure of God. As part of this transition, there was an overall change in the conception of reason. One very useful, comparatively brief account of this transition can be found in a short book by the critical theorist Max Horkheimer. The book is called Eclipse of Reason. Horkheimer gives an account of how reason was conceptualised in the pre-modern mindset. According to Horkheimer, reason was not only a force existing in the individual mind. Reason had an objective or cosmic dimension upon which the great philosophical systems of pre-modernity, such as those of Plato and Aristotle and scholasticism, were built. These systems aimed at evolving a comprehensive system or hierarchy of all beings, including humankind and its aims, where the degree of reasonableness of a person's life could be determined according to its harmony with this totality. That greater cosmic or objective structure, and not just the human being and its purposes, was to be the measuring rod for individual thoughts and actions. This pre-modern conception of reason, Horkheimer claims, never precluded or ruled out subjective reason as a force existing in the individual mind. Nonetheless, subjective reason was regarded as only a partial, limited expression of a universal rationality from which criteria for all things and beings were derived. In pre-modern societies, the measuring rod for judging individual thoughts and actions remained, in other words, beyond the grasp, influence and control of human beings. A rational existence in the modern sense is, on the whole, judged very differently. In modernity, there were attempts to reproduce the kind of cosmic thinking that I've just described. German idealism would be an example of that. But in English-speaking countries, in particular in America and Britain, a new, more pragmatic use of reason came to dominance. It prioritises calculative or instrumental reason. In a nutshell, in a context dominated by instrumental reason, much more time is spent worrying about means rather than ends. According to this point of view, one might say that an institution is now considered rational if it has been designed well. An institution is rational if it is designed according to a clear internal logic, regardless of external principles or ideals. Oddly, we arrive at a situation where institutions and individuals can be rational even in an irrational context if they still manage to pursue immediate goals in a logical manner. Institutions and individuals can be considered rational in a context that is devoid of overall reason, except the instrumental one of ensuring that the means for getting the job done are effective in their application. In Horkheimer's terms, reason is considered to be functioning and can be pursued individually, so long as it demonstrates the ability to calculate probabilities and thereby coordinate the right means with a given end. Horkheimer recognises that other, less directly instrumental forms of reason persist in modernity, but they are shorn of cosmic significance. When the philosophers of the Enlightenment attacked religion, he argues, in the name of reason, 
In the end, what they killed was not the church, but the idea of a universal order or measuring rod to which we would submit all thought and action. Reason hereby liquefied itself as an agency of ethical, moral and religious insight. Older ethical, moral and religious systems were still able to exist. Modernity did not completely obliterate pre-modern institutions, as is abundantly obvious, with the survival of two key pre-modern institutions, the university and the church. Indeed, to take the latter case, one might say that in some respects the destruction of a universal order protected religion in modernity, allowing it to continue and to some extent thrive in an increasingly secular or non-religious context. As Horkheimer argues, religion perhaps even profited from this development. The reduction of universal reason to instrumental forms made religion safe from any serious attack. Because there was no cosmic sense, no new global agreement about the meaning of life, the nature of human existence and so on, religion could not be attacked on these terms. It was not replaced by a secure modern equivalent. Religion was to some extent neutralised, of course, becoming one cultural good among others. But this allowed it to linger on and even prosper, fulfilling needs generated by modern societies filling a vacuum in social life. One might extend Horkheimer's analysis regarding religion to the high-minded ideals that lie behind the modern liberal university. Accordingly, this university has not been entirely destroyed by managerialism, audit and instrumental reason. It lingers on because its liberal ideals can be instrumentalised to some extent and rendered socially useful. Instrumental reason will accommodate itself to anything and anyone, on the condition they be rendered calculable. Thus, religious institutions, and educational ones too, may continue to exist and continue to promote systems of belief within an instrumental order. And yet, though they survive, there is a wasting away of what might be called their real spirit, before the instrumental reason that guarantees their afterlife. These ideas are discussed in more detail in Chapter 9 of Education and Philosophy. If you would like to hear another podcast discussing a key idea related to education and philosophy, click below. Thank you for listening.